Thank you for joining us for the first Her Inside Women in the Lockdown Zoom event. During lockdown, Susan Croft of Unfinished Histories created the blog Her Inside to bring together and share historical and contemporary writings by women that reflect our shared experience of physical, emotional and mental confinement. Throughout the performance, Susan will read stage directions and I will interview her in our post-show Q&A and we hope you can stay for that. The performers here tonight have been part of a play reading group, group throughout lockdown. Some professional, some community, always reading a range of parts irrespective of age, race, gender, which we'll also be doing this evening. Throughout the performance, we will post links in the chat to the various pieces so you can read along if you need to or explore them later. When it comes to the interval or the end, you can also post your own comments in the chat and we'd really love to have your feedback. We suggest that you, our audience, watch and speak of you. The first half finishes around 8.30 p.m. when we will take a short break and there will be a five minute break before the Q&A to give you time to replenish your glasses. <laughs> and so without further ado, or me going on any longer, let's start the evening with a play written in lockdown by Nikola Veronovska called Behind Doors. So picture this, three front doors and three separate women behind them. Action takes place in a UK town in June 2020, during the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. The women are in separate spaces, all behind a door. Vicky, 20, five months pregnant. Kasia, 70s, Polish. Anna. 50s, recently divorced. I can't go out. I can't go out. I can't go out. But I got to. Today, I got to go out. Now. I You're going out now. now. Not now. He's upstairs in the bathroom. Yeah. I got to go while I can. Yeah. Yes. And I don't want to be late. For you. I got to do it for you. For him? I protect me far to protect him. My grandson. My daughter. Oh, nothing's changed. No. Nothing changed. Nothing's was, changed. It was like this before bloody lockdown. Before lockdown, I no go out. Before lockdown, it was equally hard to get her out of the house. Every day, every fucking day, trapped. Always feeling trapped. Trapped? It was like she was trapped. Him, breathing down my neck, bruises on my legs, arms, smashing up my stuff. Bruises? On my arm, from little. Nothing's changed, but now it feels. Then I feel tired. And I'm so tired. I'm tired. It's normal, all time tired. Side effects from medication. But now, same. After three months, I feel tired. How can I come to terms with a divorce myself and deal with her? And it feels different. I'm lonely. She's lonely. I'm, I'm lonely. lonely. It's like the walls got, it's like the world's got darker, like the walls are higher and scarier and I've got no one to talk to. She won't talk to me. Blames me. I talk to my grandson, of course. But he not hear so much. I didn't talk before. Not about him. They think he's all right at work. A good bloke. A good dad. He good boy. Very good. And now, key worker. Now, Tack. He's 
stop him to study at university and he get job in factory. He was all right, Mark. Yeah, your dad. Before he got laid off, he never laid a finger. Always had a temper, yeah. But that was what it was, and that was it. Yep. She thinks he's a good dad. Claims to be proud of him. And I proud of him. Very. You keep me going. He make me want to get up. In the mornings, I don't want to get up. And she stays in bed. <laughs> well, she's a teenager. What do you expect? But you keep me awake too, don't you? <laughs> I don't sleep. <laughs> I no sleep. At night, when he on shift, I waking and worrying. All parents worry about their teenagers. It's not like I'm, it's not like I think he's going to do anything serious. Don't be scared. You don't need to be scared. And scared. I get scared she'll harm herself. One time I called a helpline. One time he not come back from work. One time I phoned Craig. Just one time. I don't know when. Time's blurred. Yeah. Start of lockdown around then. I was, I don't know, six weeks, seven, being sick as a dog. And it wound him up like I was making a fuss and couldn't be asked to clean the place up. I stay up and, and do some cleaning in flat for to have something to be busy. But now, very late. And he, not back. Melody was threatening stuff. All sorts. I couldn't take it anymore. I said to Craig, you'll have to take her because I can't manage it. I was like desperate and hurting like outside and inside. I hung up in the end and he said sorry and <laughs> he always says sorry. Sometimes I think he means it. <laughs> I think maybe he thought it was a tack on him. I think he thought I was being hormonal. Other times. For exit or something. When he had a job, we got on. When he comes back, it's 2 a.m. I have her weekends, he said, as if she's a primary school classroom hamster that gets loaned out to a deserving child. This is your daughter, I tell him. At factory is no delivery and some staff sick. I say, why you not call me Mateusz? He say, Babcha, was too late. <laughs> He's still in the bathroom. He's still at work. She's still upstairs. I can't do this. I can't do it. Melody. I don't know what he'll do. I can't go out. You can go out, Babcha, he tell me. Shielding now finish. He won't come with me. But I no want. For first time to go out, I want to go alone. I don't know why. I don't know why she can't just put on her shoes and come for a stroll with me. He'll try and stop me. He says it's not safe, that he needs to keep an eye on me. Pregnant women are high risk, he knows. Saw it on the BBC, but I know that's bollocks. He's worried I'll bolt, as if, where I'd go. And what about you? I worried for to go out. Mateusz, he wa he my family, my everything, and I for him, same. And what to do for him if I die? It's not going to kill her. When the test was positive, before all the staying at home shit, he said he'd turn over a new leaf. Yeah, start looking for work again, <laughs> even if the pay was bad. Nothing is so bad like cancer. <laughs> Before I thinking this, always. Before it come to me and after. <laughs> but I, I'm wrong. This illness, virus, I think can be worse. Dying. It is one thing, for all of us will happen one day, of course. But alone? Oh, I, 
I don't want to die alone. Mateusz, he think he grown up. He think he know everything. He would in world for to know love, sex, and everything. He know this, but he young. If he ha if he now have me to help him with this life, no, no. If I wasn't here. I sometimes wonder what she'd do. Am I the problem? No. Craig divorced me. I'm not the one who had an affair. He started calling me princess again. And I like that. For you'll bring him back, baby. I thought we can be like, I don't know, family and all that. It didn't last. And there's loads of jobs now, like in supermarkets, whatever. But he don't do nothing. He just sits on the sofa, swearing at the, te at the telly or at me. If I didn't have you, outside people are dying and I'm crying and when I switch on the telly, bawling my eyes out at the news. I now watch news. She watches the news endlessly. People dying and so on. No. That can't be healthy. But you make me feel alive. Hormones and that. <laughs> like a roller coaster I am. Up and down and happy sort of. It now made me happy. Will she be happy again? <laughs> Will I? The midwife says she needs to see me. Consultants say I need to go out for exercise, of course, but also mental, <laughs> no tag, stress. Divorce is stressful for everyone. Five years I living in UK. Time go very quickly. I come in when his mother died. He very young then, and for me, big change, big stress. At first, he miss Mama very much. He missing her, of course, and sometimes he bad to me. Sometimes the twinges are bad, but it's probably nothing. Probably fine. But, you know, you've got to check it out, yeah. It's all distance and safe, the midwife says. But Mark says it's not safe. He says, I can't go. No way. But what if there's a problem, I say? He says I'm neurotic. Why would there be a problem with his baby? What, does I, do I think he's a monster with six heads or something? No, I say. But, you know, he says you're fine and I'm the problem. And I, I just want to go to my appointment, I say. And then he hits me. Sometimes I want to hit her. Sometimes I wanted to hit him, my grandson, not her. My own daughter. Oh, he don't hit me in the belly. He's thinking of you. He don't want to harm you. Here. He hits me here. And it's like nothing what he ain't but done before, but oh, the shock of it. I'm very shocked when Carl ran over Maria. Just to shock her out of this pointless, adolescent stupor. Wake up, Melody. A fool. And he helps me up and he says, forget the fucking appointment because this is, this is what happens when you're stupid. And I look at him. When I get off the plane, I look at Mateo. I tell him, I hear now. Bob shall look after you. She looks at me and there's this dullness in her eyes. I look at him and I say, I'm going. Two words, I'm going. That could set him off big time. Could cost me my life, my baby's life. But something inside of me snapping and ripping and breaking and... And something inside of me. Life no good in Poland, always. You know, no money, my husband drinking, before end of communism, life very hard. And I ask myself, why is life this hard? And it's not that I don't care, it's that I'm not scared. I'm scared. Why are we all so scared? 
And say it again, I'm going. And I don't want to go out. I just wanted to go out. But you don't get angry. He's crying. Yeah, like for real. Holding out his hands to me like he's sorry or something. And I look at him and I, I feel nothing. Just you. I feel you kicking. Yeah, like that. Alive. I want to stay alive. To feel alive. I run down the stairs and I hear him going to the bathroom. I hear him telling me he's going to kill himself. Slash his wrist with a razor like what his mum did. Oh, as if. Please, God. Melody, please. It's all right. We're going to be all right. But we got to go. I will stay here. She wants to stay here. She shouts back at me from inside her bedroom. It's her choice. Why can't I leave her alone? And if he did, he won't. But if... To be safe. She says it's her life. I want to think of you. I think of him. Of Mateos. And I think... Suddenly I think, yes. And if... If he... Because if I die... Because in the end, it is her choice. I've got to get you out of here. How do you survive here? We all have to survive the way we need to. I want to show you the world, baby. This crazy world. This crazy time. And so soon after the divorce. I want you to live. I want you to live. I want to stop telling her how to live. I want. Vicky opens the door and slams it behind her. Asha steps back. Anna hesitates. A powerful piece that reminds us we never quite know what's going on behind closed doors. We've put the National Domestic Violence Helpline in the chat box. Please share with anyone who may need it. And now, Yutori, a poem written by Fiona Graham in May 2020. Yutori, listen, listening, listen. A bell tolls ten times while water trickles. The birds begin their song of freedom. In the distance, cars are moving. An empty train crosses the downs and inside the house, a couple are quiet. Listen, listening, listen. He is used to his daily rhythm, striding forward on a linear path with purpose and entitlement. She is used to being interrupted to a winding, meandering path with moments of lost, and found. Listen. Listening. Listen. Two old ladies gardening in the sunshine with a large stone wall between them. They meet every day in this way, but have not been touched for weeks. Two small children stand outside a window, holding cards and blowing kisses. I love you, Grandpa. I miss you, Grandma. Till their parents lead them away. Listen. Listening. Listen. She moves between activities, yoga, making, reading, baking, always thinking of others, but desperate to move forward. On the other side of the world, he prepares her Spanish lesson 
staying up through the night, dreaming of another life. Listen, listening, listen. One at a time, the customers enter as she begins her 12 hour shift. She sighs behind her mask and begins to watch the clock. Another day in this bedsit room. He rises early and stares out the window. The calls start at nine and finish by five when he pounds the roads to escape the day. Listen, listening, listen. You Tori. The Japanese word for the space to stand back and contemplate what we are living and experiencing. Layers of loss and longing and love. Thank you, Tricia. Next up, writer and actress Nora Connolly will read her piece, Today I Apologised, written in June 2020. Hello, here's my story. Today, I apologize to a pot of potatoes that was simmering on my cooker. Oh, sorry, I said, as I'd accidentally bumped into the handle. I live on my own and I don't have a cat anymore. Oh, how I miss my cat. I'm in lockdown, but able to go to my local shops every few days. I wear a mask, <laughs> they wear a mask, and the gloves, of course. But it's so strange to be cut off from one another. I begin to wonder about my state of mind. When I was a child, one of my favorite television programs in the old black and white days was The Lone Ranger. He wore a mask but not like the ones we are obliged to wear now, of course. His sidekick, Tonto, always called him Kimo Sabi. And the music at the beginning was utterly thrilling. That was when television was in black and white and life seemed simpler. We played cowboys and Indians with pretending guns and bows and arrows. Bang, bang, you're dead. I'm grown up now, and I don't know what children play in this day and age. All these computer games, fighting aliens are beyond my understanding. Ah, but then that's the way it is. Life moves on with all its complications, and I try to move with it. No point in living in the past. The present seems so confusing and the future so difficult to imagine beyond this vile virus. I'm lucky, which, <laughs> as it happens, was the name of my cat. I have a, a, a bit of a garden and the cat next door occasionally strolls in. I don't know its name and it looks at me in that superior way that cats do and then clears off again. Shows little interest in me, keeps its distance, won't let me touch him or stroke him. Ah, that's what I'm missing. Touching things, people, ah. Oh. The pot of potatoes obviously didn't reply to me. No manners at all. 
I know I'm not going mad. It's just me being a wee bit silly tonight. I'm going to mash all those potatoes up with lots of butter to have for me dinner on me own like the Lone Ranger. Hi-ho, Silver! Thank you, Nora. I did like how you mashed the potatoes when they didn't answer you back. That'll teach them. We now have a poem by Mary Elizabeth Coolridge. She lived from 1861 to 1907, and her poems were not published until 1908, after her death. The Other Side of the Mirror by Mary Elizabeth Coleridge. I sat before my glass one day and conjured up a vision bare, unlike the aspects glad and gay that erst were found reflected there. The vision of a woman wild with more than womanly despair. Her hair stood back on either side, a face bereft of loveliness. It had no envy now to hide, what once no man on earth could guess. It formed the thorny aureole of hard and sanctified distress. Her lips were open, not a sound came through the parted lines of red. Whate'er it was, the hideous wound in silence and in secret bled. No sigh relieved her speechless woe. She had no voice to speak her dread. And in her lurid eyes there shone the dying flames of life's desire, made mad because its hope was gone and kindled at the leaping fire of jealousy and fierce revenge and strength that could not change nor tire. Shade of a shadow in the glass Oh, set the crystal surface free, pass as the fairer visions pass, no ever more return to be the ghost of a distracted hour that heard me whisper, I am she. Thank you, Anna. And now for our final piece of this half, we will hear a one-act play written by April De Angelis in 1986. And after this, there will be a short break. Nothing but the clock ticking. Do you think I may get a caller today? Or a letter? The rain hasn't stopped pattering, pattering. Why is this house on a hill in the middle of nowhere? No one would bother to walk up a hill like that, would you? I wouldn't. I'm not allowed to in any case. Doctor's orders. I'm of a nervous disposition. Magda, I think the dog's run off. It was night time. I called her and called her, but she didn't come. Once or twice I heard her bark, or so I thought. I keep expecting her to come bounding towards me, all in a pant and a flurry and smelling of dog and wanting her biscuit. But there was nothing just a stillness and a silence. Now she's gone and I'm all alone. There's only you to look after me. Do you believe in ghosts, Magda? I do. I think a ghost made me ill. God bless Papa and Magda the servant. I'm in a place myself in your hands this night. O oh Lord, whose divine suffering gave to your children eternal life. Amen and good night. There is a crash of thunder, and Magda is lit up stage left by lightning and mid-experiment in the posture of a fiendish scientist. It's just thunder. A natural phenomenon resulting from the continued discharge of charged particles such as protons and electrons from the clouds generally accompanied by heavy rain. A brief surge of heavy rain sounds on cue. It's just thunder. It's just my nerves. Just as I was beginning to think I was cured. Once upon a time there was a girl called Minna. For six months she lay here flat on her back. Her pillows were soft and numbing. The curtains were heavy and drawn. She lay in the half dark. 
she was ill. Warm baths, cool baths, then warm baths. She abstained from all animal flesh and ate only soft liquid foods. No books, no pencils. She was recommended the complete elimination of all mental excitement. The elimination of all excitement. I'm ill of a nervous disposition. Troubled with the green sickness deriving from the disorderly nature of my female organs. No light. No light and soft food. Everyone goes quietly past Minister, whispering. Sometimes I'm afraid I still have the ghost in me that made me sick. Storm was getting worse. Minna goes to sleep, lights down on her and up slowly on Magda. Magda is revealed, busily conducting a simple experiment. After all, women were the first scientists. We discovered the chemistry of the pot making and of physics, of spinning, fashioned the first tools with which we sharpened, planted and dug. We cultivated hundreds of species of plants. In Africa, our foremothers domesticated barley, flax, millet, wheat. In China, rice. In North America, potatoes and maize. We selected, developed and fed the world. We learned that plants can heal through our tireless observation and imaginative experimentation, we discovered which herbs have what effects, how the juice of one plant when smeared onto our skins could freeze our pain or when smeared under the tongue could make us weightless, make us fly. We delivered our own children. We learned that plants can heal. We learned that plants can destroy like the careful scientists we are, and we were, we wasted nothing. More secretly, we had our own rituals with which we gained inspiration and support. Slowly and ritualistically, as the lights dim, Magda finishes her experiment. Minna is awake and has lit her candle. She is reading from an old book. With light and hasty steps, Lady Emily passed through the gloomy and mysterious recesses of the castle, lit only by the feeble glimmer of her lamp, which the moaning wind threatened at any moment to extinguish. <sighs> a lonely silence reigned. Now and then she heard a faint peak of low laughter. She half suspected the coarse, dull, witting serving maid, but quelling her suspicion, she continued. All of a sudden, amid the grim shadows, Emily espied an ancient doorway. <gasps> her hand, so delicate, so pale, reached out. The door swung open, its age-old hinges emitting a ghastly creak. <laughs> Trembling. Almost fainting with terror, Emily had yet sufficient command to gather the feeble remains of her spirit and check the shriek that was escaping from her lips before dropping senseless to the floor. She is in the laboratory. Magda comes forward and stands over her. Magda! It's you! I thought you were a ghost. Um, this is I father's place. You shouldn't be here. I heard a noise. Something moving around. I thought it might be the dog. I came down to see. It's very dark. Yes, it is dark. Is this where he does his experiments? I thought you were a ghost or a witch. Will you say anything, Minna? This is father's place. If he came back and found you, He's on a voyage. On a big ship. Far away. Looking for rare rocks. Bones. Bits of gold. 
chemicals and weapons. He's not going to come back for a long time. He's famous. Well respected. A scientist. A fossil. Hunter. You shouldn't be here, Magda. No, Minna. Magda? Yes, Minna? If the door's always locked, how did you open it? Father always keeps his key about his person. He even sleeps with it under his pillow. He never lets it off his chain. There's no light down here. It's like a tomb. Minna? Would you like to hear a joke? Let's laugh together. What about? When we were children. And could run. And shout. And shout. And fight. Shouting, running in the fresh air. So much fresh air. You looked after me, that was your job. We played the invisible cloak. I can almost remember. It transported us to wild and dangerous places. We explored them together. I can almost remember. We travelled at night like ghosts. It took daring and courage and great physical stamina. I can't remember. It was such a long time ago. I was different. I remember playing Queen of the Castle and you were my horse, Dirty Rascal. Nina climbs up piggyback style on Magda's back. Giddy up. I can remember playing this game. Round and round we went. Sometimes you didn't play properly. You were a bad horse and didn't do what I said. I was the queen and it wasn't fair. You kept secrets from me. You kept secrets from me and it wasn't fair. Magda, you've been here before, other times. Before this, other times. Minna climbs down. You've been haunting the laboratory. Magda walks over to the work table. She pulls off her headscarf and moves majestically. We see a transformation. Magda, is that you? You look different, changed. I was drawn by the smells first, that strange combination of rotten eggs and charcoal. It drew me down where I wasn't allowed to go, revealed to me that I shouldn't have seen taught me that I was never supposed to know. A confession. I'd slip unseen into the laboratory and crouch there among the shadows. I went again and again. I used guile and lies. There was so much to see. Conical flasks, test tubes, Bunsen burners, luminous crystals, green, yellow and black powders, pickled spleens in acetic acid. Oh. Gar gas jars and glass slides. Oh. What do spleens look like? Clamp stands and gauzes. Oh. The spleen. A soft, pulpy, blood-modifying organ close to the stomach. Then one day, I discovered a strange new piece of equipment on the work table. I looked through the eyepiece and saw something moving, splitting, changing. I knew even then that there below me, so tiny and unstoppable, was life. It was from that moment that I was possessed with a longing to know more and more what that was and why it was and how it made me to know how all the millions and fragments in the universe are propelled by their own pure and perfected laws. I'm not well, Magda. I can't breathe. I don't want to hear anymore. I want to get well. Let's talk about something else. I made more and more frequent excursions and stole books from his library. I rifled his notes. I began to learn. Lady Emily smiled through her tears. Dear father, she said as her voice trembled. At first, the simplest things seemed unreachable. She tried to say, sir, I will show myself worthy of being your daughter. I stayed awake at night, learning simple formula, all by heart, saying it over and over in my head like a poem. But a mingled emotion of gratitude and affection and grief overcame her. 
It meant nothing to me. And she wept without interruption. Sometimes I wept because there was no one to guide me. But the numbers and figures whirled around and round in my head. Trembling and weeping. Weeping and trembling, a mad dance. A mad dance. Then slowly, the sense came, a breakthrough, like the flesh of, flash even, of ignited magnesium, as satisfying as a perfectly balanced equation. At that moment, I knew how the great Caroline Herschel felt as she discovered the comet. My first experiment. <laughs> Matches. Hydrogen gas. Minna fetches a jar. It's going to go. Bang. <laughs> what is it? A ghost. Footsteps on the stairs. Is it a ghost? Step by step. I can't look. The air froze. My heart is pumping blood so fast. Left oracle to left ventricle to body to right oracle to right ventricle to lungs. I gasped. It came towards me. And back to the left oracle. I can't look. Discovered. Father, you were found out. I was made an example of. In public? I became a specimen. I can remember this game. In the frog, female, in spring, the breeding season. The nervous excitability of the animal is such that any slight irritation of the skin surface. A deft jab with a steel needle. For example. Uh, uh, will induce convulsions. Of almost epileptic proportions. <laughs> Similarly, we can observe in the... Human, female disorders of the reproductive system producing similar results. We must beware, gentlemen, of any interference in the growth of these organs during the adolescence of the female. I refer, of course, to the human and not the frog genus. If any of the vital energy is necessary for the correct development of the reproductive organs is diverted into such foolhardy and ill-conceived actions as serious study, the results, I hasten to add, may be catastrophic. I myself have witnessed in many such cases <coughs> the inducement, inducement of hysteria, neurasthenia, bad digestion, astigmatism, painful menstruation, insanity, and even flat-chestedness. I can only add as regards to the more stubborn cases, that radical surgery, I refer to the removal of both ovaries, has often proved entirely successful. Although I don't recommend the passing around of the vanquished organs on dinner plates at parties as our more professional American cousins are wont to do. dragging feeling. I'm a dead thing, barely breathing, heavy limbs, leaden. My head is made of lead, my head too. My illness is upon me, let me be. The sky pressed down on me so heavily I didn't go out. I imitate a dead person. My voice is just a breeze. I can't shout. Zombie. My sickness is upon me. My voice is air. A composition of air. You were forbidden. Nitrogen and oxygen. 
Your room was searched. Carbon dioxide. The laboratory was padlocked. Hydrogen and small droplets of water. You were watched. And you were ill. I dreamt. I dreamt too. I'm in a garden. I am in a garden. And the sun's on my face. It has every species of, of, of herb, plant, bird and, and fish imaginable. It's a green garden and my legs are springy and I can run or walk as I choose. I choose my path carefully and at length I find myself at an observatory. It has large light windows. The air's warm and smells nice. I breathe easily. Inside are women with their hair tied in scarves of every colour imaginable. I begin climbing a hill. They take my hand and show me their work. All the time the wind is blowing on my face and the sun is shining. It is fabulous. Up and up. I take huge gulps of air. I race up the hill and I make stones scatter. It is thorough and exact and pioneering. Till I'm at the top and I can look down laughing at the beautiful garden. I smile. I am at home. Magda, someone just stepped on my grave. I've got shivers up and down my spine. All my hairs have hyperpolated. Magda. Magda. There's someone else here with us. Like a nightmare, I can feel it. Someone else? Or some thing. You're right. I'd long dreamt of escape. The solution came to me as I lay one night in a feverish half-sleep. The spark caught. I embarked upon my task to create for myself another living being. A monster. A man. A living, warm-blooded human creature. Mammals have been successful in a tremendous variety of habitats. They're insulated from the environment by their characteristically hairy and waterproof skin. A man with inclinations not unlike my own. One, George Bell, Esquire. George Bell? <clears throat> kind sir, I humbly request permission to submit to you a scientific paper concerning the fundamental nature of matter. Since my studies have been largely unaided, the work may appear somewhat rough and rude, but I trust you will forgive such failings in an untutored but dedicated lover of the sciences. I hope nonetheless that there is genius enough in this paper to enable me to enter your establishment as a student. I remain your humble and obedient servant, George Bell. The answer? <clears throat> Interesting. <laughs> Suggests a certain originality. Your submission. A, a certain originality. Happy to, to grant your request. A certain... George Bell, a resounding success. Kind sir. So much is at stake that I hesitate to set pen to paper. Uh, Mr. George Bell Esquire is a fiction, a fiction wrung from necessity. The creation of a desperate woman afraid that her sex may have been the means to prejudice her cause. I can only hope that, uh, I can only hope that I remain your anxious servant I can only hope. George Bell? Is dead. Murdered? Poor Mr Bell. 
a certain delicacy of constitution, absence of the capacity of abstract reasoning in woman, no alternative but to reject your request. Trust that our correspondence is at an end, an end. A certain delicacy of the constitution. Minna, on this note, moves into the background, ghost-like. Magda busies herself putting on an apron. She becomes a traditional housekeeper. She turns to the table and picks up a knife. For a moment, she appears sinister, then begins chopping a vegetable. We never did have many visitors up at the Yaw. It was a lonely place with bats. <laughs> the master was a very private person. His beautiful bride died tragically. He carved a redstone himself, a giant angel with great stone feet. We kept ourselves to ourselves. We didn't ask questions. We did hear noises, but we put it down to the plumbing. The daughter had a terrible temper, so they said. She wanted things her way. She had some sort of fit. She'd been strange since a child, once they'd found her, with her hands under the bedclothes. He sent for the doctor who came up from the village with his black bag. They say she foamed at the mouth. I spat at him. The doctor said she was sickening. Fifteen and such a terrible temper. And we didn't see much of her after that. The doctor said she was sickening. I am shouting. It's so hard to stop the shouts coming up because trying to stop them is like trying to swallow back down huge angry bubbles that won't go back down. There are arms in soft cloths pushing me down and they're like moths beating about my face and stifling me. And all I can think is how much my stays are biting and how hard it is to take a breath. Then it's quiet. Another day. Everyone goes quietly past Minna's room. I'm ill and I'm lying quietly but there are still strange words in my head. My shouts echo, and there's a ghost rattling my bones like the bars of a cage. I know she wants to get out. Magda walks over to Minna. She sits down and Minna sits at her feet. I'll tell you a story. Once there was a woman called Magda who wasn't allowed to play in the laboratory. One day, the scientist found her there among the crystals and the bottles, and he was very angry until a thought struck him. Magda knew how to sweep the floor and wash up his test tubes, polish Bunsen burners, keep notes and write up simple experiments. And so the scientist decided to make Magda his assistant because Magda was efficient and diligent. The scientist slowly grew to trust her. As time went by, his vigilance grew slacker. He even left Magda alone in the laboratory with all his precious shiny equipment. Magda lost no time. She poked and pried and spied and read and made miscalculations, read again and made the correct calculations and made fancy experiments which were loud, smelly and colorful. She was making great progress. When one particular afternoon she stumbled upon the secret of the scientist's life's work in which she, with all her polishing and note-taking, had unwittingly aided him. Magda felt like she'd stepped into a lift shaft. It's so dark down here. The scientist's work had the stench of destruction about it. Dark and cold. Nothing to heal, nothing to grow, nothing. It's like a tomb. Something to steal the breath. Just like a tomb. 
Despite all the endless configurations and the immense possibilities of combinations of numbers, Magda was repeatedly brought to the one conclusion. She had little alternative of if her calculations were correct. We've been sealed up a long time, Minna. Kept from the air. You can breathe easily now, Minna. Egyptian priestesses from the Nile practiced healing long before the birth of Christ. They diagnosed pregnancy and predicted the sex of the unborn child. It's the mother's face. If the mother's face was green, it would be a boy. They set bones with splints, performed caesarean sections, treated for breast cancer and irregular menstruation. Isis was their inspiration. She invented the science of embalming. Do you think father will be away for a long time, Magda? The brain was removed by means of a bronze hook which reached the interior of the skull from the nose by perforating the, the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. The cavity was then cleansed with a solution of drugs. Emily paused a moment to look for one last time at the castle which had been her home for so long. The intestines, stomach, liver and spleen were generally removed through an opening made in the abdominal wall. In some cases, the lungs were also removed by way of an incision in the diaphragm. The rising sun threw its towers into dark relief. The heart and kidneys were left alone. It was with a light and sure foot that Emily stepped off the pathway. After the organs had been removed from the body, the body was rinsed out with wine, myrrh and cassia. And hitching up her trailing skirts, she climbed over the fence and set off alone across the field. Finally, the body was carefully bandaged, wrapped in a, wrapped in a soft linen, smeared with gum and wax and left to dry and buried. The, the morning air was bright and fresh. She took a deep breath. The end. Oh, what a stirring piece that was. Let's now take a 10 minute break and to lead us into it, here are some images and a song composed in lockdown by Helen Chadwick. Please be back here for 28.46. That's precise, isn't it? During the interval, you're also welcome to post comments and feedback in the chat. 2046, thank you. The complete quiet lasting weeks on end. I really miss the peace and potency. No cars, no planes, only the wind in the trees and birdsong. Cycling on almost traffic-free roads was a complete joy With just the skylarks and verge flowers for company Knowing nature thrived while our world changed Kingfishers, cormorants, dragonflies, the river swirling its way to the sea. These thoughts fed my spirit in these uncertain times. From caterpillar to cocoon, after months, we released some hawk moths. They hummed and vibrated on my finger. Emerging, they said, off. In Ireland, they called the lockdown a cocoon. And that would be my chosen word for this strange summer. Knowing nature thrived while our world changed 
the trees weaving their canopies, the bluebells filling the woodlands. These thoughts fed my spirit in these uncertain times. The upstream soil washed into the water by floods brings phosphates, algae, will it ever be the same? A Mr. and Mrs. Mallard took to sitting just outside the doors of the supermarket. Strange incongruous company for our socially distanced queue. Later staycation people found our village and converged on the tump to watch and swim. Dozens of cars blocked the roads. Will it ever be the same again? Knowing nature thrived while our world changed. The trees weaving their canopies. The bluebells filling the woodlands These thoughts fed my spirit In these uncertain times And further upstream Soil washed into the water by floods Brings phosphates, algae Will it ever be the same? Will it ever be the same? Will it ever be the same? Welcome back. We begin this final section of the evening with a piece performed by writer and Hair Inside workshop facilitator, Sarada Subrayan. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a great privilege to be reading tonight. I'm going to be reading from Off the Hook. It's a fragmented verse memoir. And this is part three. At rest, peace at last or not. It's a strange remedy rest, taking rest, being at rest, resting. It's an unquantifiable remedy, although they do say a 10 minute rest here or there, 90 minutes being the optimum concentration time, or the time it takes to read a sonnet, 3.5 minutes, something like that. And obviously there are different kinds of rest, active rest, meditation. There is some form of doing there, or actively nothing, doing nothing. I think what hits me most was the comfort of her voice coming up through the pillow and that deep falling into the sound of a story, a kind of tale that you could sum how, where, as if there was a corridor connecting my ear canal with wherever I was being led to and the brain processing images and yet staying with it really, mostly. I was already curled up like a prawn. My safety positions, like a recurring theme in my artwork, the snail pose, the slowness overtaking me and the breath and the breath and suddenly I'm comatose. Halfway between powerlessness and being held, 
nowhere to go, nothing to do, nothing to see, but be there with her voice. It's an active voice, not necessarily so sufferer, sufferer. I can never say that word. It wouldn't normally make me go to sleep, her voice. But I think it's the combination of a week of no sleep, of anxiety, the comfort of the body against the softness of the bed, a kind of makeshift camping. But before the COVID ruling, there was the solidarity of bodies. I would so often sort them out in times of distress. I would need overnight resting spaces to manage the chaotic fear cycle running through my brain, to feel next to the sleeping body, the resting body, a waking body. The kind of the closest of strangers, as it were, not having to respond to them in any shape or form. And yet my presence was always felt, and theirs too. And sometimes in these communal sleeping arrangements, there would be a hug, an acknowledgement, a smile, a goodbye, a wish you on your journey, for these were all journey people making their way to and from. And all I wanted to do was just be still and be here. And I fell into her voice and I slept, but it was not sleep. It was a rest. And there is a difference, a kind of surface layer of sleep, like a kind of shallow end. I was there floating in the shallow end of her voice. Thank you, Sarada. That was so moving, it was beautiful. Thank you. So we will now perform a play written in 1911 called In the Workhouse. It was written by a suffrage campaigner and workhouse visitor, Margaret Wynne Nevinson, who captured real voices of women in the workhouse to expose the wrongs of the act of coverture, a law which meant married women had no separate legal existence from their husbands. So if the husband went into the workhouse, his wife and children were forced to go with him. Or if he left the workhouse to try to get work outside or even go to the pub, they had to follow him. It's from a time when a respectable man and woman would have the bands read out three times in church of their intention to marry and the lines or marriage lines and a official marriage certificate was the mark of propriety. In the Workhouse by Margaret Wynne Nevinson. Lily, a coarse red faced Cockney girl. Wilhelmina, thin and worn, about 40, a wasted, consumptive looking woman. Monica, idiot girl, about 18. Ethel, refined and pretty parlour maid. Penelope Law, a tall, voluptuous woman, about 30. Mrs Cleaver, respectable middle-aged matron, very overheated. Mrs Jarvis, middle-aged, drunken and coarse. Infants. <laughs> <laughs> Scene, a workhouse ward, yellow washed walls with a few texts about. In everything give thanks. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Little children love one another. Bedsteads and cots covered with red coverlets. Infants, Lily, Mrs Jarvis, Wilhelmina and Monica are discovered. All are in pauper dress, dark blue cotton gowns, ill fitting with white caps and aprons. Lily is rocking her baby. Monica is standing by the window singing. She has her baby in her arms. All oh, things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. All oh, things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. 
As the curtain rises, Ethel, with open letter in her hand, runs in and flings herself on the bed, sobbing. <laughs> the told me in the green wood, the play, the rush is by the wall, we gather every day. There, there, did him. Don't cry, my beauty. We're going out tomorrow, my pet. And father's going to marry us. Don't be too sure, my wench. There's many a slip twist the cup and the lip. And fathers don't always turn up, you know, on these occasions. The mission lady's seeing to it. She's bought a ring and put up the bands. And Augustus says she's promised him a sovereign if he turns up at the church door punctual at ten. She's got another lady to mind the baby too whilst, in the, whilst I'm in the church, so as not to shame me. Can't take you to the wedding, Ducky, now, can I? The sovereign may do the trick, but men are slippery cads to the like of us, as no doubt you know. I remember well how I stood in the church at Fox Earth, up on the moors, waiting for my child's father, the parson in his surplice ready to make us one, and poor mother a running up and down, a cocking her head, uh, down every pub, waiting and looking for my child's father. Um, but he ain't turned up, neither then nor since. And that is nigh on 20 years ago. <laughs> Things are restless tonight, Mrs. Jarvis. Seems cruel hard on a mother to bring forth a pair of superfluous twins and no father between them. What's the law of the land on this matter? Do you get five shillings each? Or are you held responsible for the extra one? None of your lip, Wilhelmina. I'm a married lady. That's what I am, and I'll thank you to remember it. I'm sure I beg your pardon, Mrs. What's-the-name. Only... I understood you to say as Mr. Jarvis had been dead some years. Well, and if he has, ain't I got the ring in the lines? Just the same. It's all a difference, my girl. I can't tell you between my position and you bad women in here. There, there. Keep your hair on. Don't you know it is an unwritten law in these state rooms that pots don't call kettles black? I do love my baby. That's a mercy, my dear. As no one else ain't likely to. Who's the baby's father, Monica? Bill. What's the baby's name? Bill. Got any more babies, Monica? Yeah. Two babies. Two Bills. Three Bills. I love my Bills. And where are the other bills? Don't know. Well, I ain't a saint myself, but I do think as the propagation of idiots ought to be stopped. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear, dear. <laughs> what's the matter with that poor soul? The organisation lady outside has written and told her mother where she is and she's terrible upset. Poor Ethel. She's a different sort to us. Father's a coachman in an Earl's family and she was keeping it quiet from them, hoping her young would marry her before they knew. But now her mother's written to her very cruel and it's just about broke her heart. She feels she's disgracing them. Quite natural, too. A dirty bit of busybodying, I call that. There, there, Ethel, my wench. Don't he cry, dearie. It's hard, I know the first time. Cruel hard, but we gets used to it. Don't he cry, dearie. <laughs> oh, did it want its mother, my lamb? Here, Penny, like, take you, young monkey. It's waking a crew of them, just as they were going off nicely. Ain't Mrs Cleaver back yet? Not yet. She's gone to appear before the board. 
she gave in her discharge two or three days ago, but her husband says she's got to stop here with him. And Master says that's the law of the land. So, but not believing such nonsense, she's gone to complain on them both to the board. And a fine dose she's having. I hate appearing before them committees. Last time I went, I called the lady sir and the gentleman mum, and my art went a patter in my breast so you could have knocked me down with a feather. The purple headed mountain the river running by the sun set in the evening that brightens up the sky Just ask to that purple headed mountains and sunsets Lord child hold your row turns me creepy in my insides to hear of such things in here. We who never goes out, year in, year out. Doing time is better than this. Even in Holloway, he runs around the yard and sees a bit of sky for one hour. Lord, how it makes me think of Yorkshire, hearing that there him. Why? Oh, here's Mrs. Cleaver. Well, my dear, you do look bad. Sit thee down and tell us all about it. Oh, them committees always turns me dead sick and my boots feel too tight for me and I goes into a perspiration and the, the great drops go dropping off me for it. Well, he's kept his word and got the law and right of England behind him. Oh, that is dreadful. Oh, that dreadful. should be allowed. Well, I went afore the committee and I says, I want to take my discharge. I says, I applied last week to Master, but mine got at him first. And Master up and says, no, Mrs Cleaver, you can't go. He says, your husband can't spare you. He says, wants you to keep him company in here. He says... Bastard. Oh, God. Is that true, Buster? said the little man what sits lost in a big chair. That is so, says the master. And then he out with a big book and he reads something very learned and brain confusing that I didn't rightly understand as to our husband may detain his wife in the workhouse by his marital authority. Good heavens. Is that the law of England? That's what the Lady Guardian said, uh, that comes up here dressed so shabby. Heavens, she said, same as you. Is that the law of England? Then they all began talking at once, most excited on the... And the little man in a big cherry beats like a, a madman on the table with a hammer and no one takes the slightest bit of notice. But when some quiet was restored, the little man asked me to tell the board the circumstances. So I says how he lost his work through being drunk on duty, which was the lying tongues of the police, for his head was clear. The drink holds taken him in the legs, like most cabmen, and the old horse keeps sober. It was the thick fog and he just got off the box to lead the horse through the gates of the mews and the policeman spotted his legs walking out in contrary directions, though his head was clear as daylight. <laughs> so the police ran him in and the beak took his licence from him and here we are. And now I've got over my confinement and the child's safe in heaven. After all the worry and starvation, I thought I'd like to go out and earn my own living. I'm a dressmaker by trade and my sister will give me a home. I ain't been here living on the rates and him not having done better for us than this Bastille. Although I always say it was the lying tongue of a policeman. Well, it seems fair I should go free. The lady what comes around Sundays told me I ain't got no responsibility for my children, being a married woman with the lines. 
That's quite true. You can hear the suffragette ladies are saying that at any street corner. Well, it is time. The guardians learnt it, but the little man in the big chair, he flew out most violent. Don't talk like that, my good woman, he says. Of course you have responsibility for your children. You must not believe what ignorant people tell you. Then I heard the tall ginger hair chap in what sits next the little man, as, as you unmarried girls go before to try and father your children. I heard him say quite distinct, the woman is right, sir. Married women are not responsible for their children. But I believe the husband is within his rights in refusing to allow her to leave the workhouse without him. Then they told me to retire and I should know the result later. Oh, Lord. I'm that hot and upset with the worry of it. I think I'll never cool again. Single life has its advantages. You with the lines ain't always been as polite as you might to us. You ain't got them. But we has to laugh over you, really. I'm taking my discharge tomorrow morning and not one amongst them dare stop me. I don't have to appear at four boards and be worried and upset with husbands and guardians and things before I, I can take myself off the parish and eat my bread independent. But why weren't you married, Pennyloaf? Not for want of asking, I'll be bound. Oh, no, it wasn't for lack of asking. Fact is, I was put off marriage at a very early age. I had a drunken beast of a father who spent his time drinking by day and beating my mother by night. One night, he overdid it and killed her. He got quad for life and we was put away in them workhouse schools. It would have been kinder of the parish to put us in the lethal chamber as they do the cats and dogs as ain't wanted. But we grew up somehow, knowing as we wasn't wanted, and then the parish found me a place under housemaid in a big house. And then I found out as the young master wanted me. The first time since mother died as any human soul had taken an interest in me. And Lord, <laughs> I laughs now and I think what a happy time that was. Since then, I've had five children and 25 shillings a week coming in regular besides what I can make at the cooking. Did you manage to get five shillings a week? The lawyer chaps don't seem to do much for us. Oh, I don't bother with lawyer chaps. I make my own arrangements and not one man has gone back on his promise. I lives clean and respectable. No drinking, no bad language. My children never see near what I saw and heard. And they are mine, mine, mine. I always come into the house for confinement, back in quiet and skilled medical attention. I never gets refused. The law dare not refuse such as me. <coughs> Married ladies, <coughs> it's you. You married ladies just can't get in here. I always leave the coming in till the last moment. Then there are no awkward questions. And when they begin to inquire as to settlement, I'm far away. All the women in our street are expecting next week. Their husbands all out of work and not a pair of sheets of the price of the pint of milk between them. All lying in one room too, as I don't consider decent. But having the lines, it's precious hard for them to get taken in here. And besides... Half of them don't even try, for for he and someone else will sell up the house whilst they are away. Yes, that's quite true. The law seems against us respectable women. You remember the lady has died last week in the lying in? Well, she told me she tried to get in here weeks ago, her husband being out of work all right, and she felt very queer and low but the board said that she was the wife of an able-bodied man and he was responsible for her and must find work. But she got here in the end, spite of them all, for her husband swore at her so fearful for having twins that the doctor nearly fought him for being a brute and he ordered her in here out of his way. But what with all the upset and the starvation whilst she was carrying of him, it was too late to save her. She took fever and snuffed out like a candle. And it was fearful to hear her raving and crying out to him not to beat her till the child was born. If I had my time again, I'd not marry. 
not I. What? Mrs Cleaver, you say that? Yes, and I means it too. The idea of keeping me here with that drunkard when I know the trade. And look how us married ladies has to turn out if he chooses to take his discharge and, and wander about with the kiddies and the rain and the snow with no clothes nor decent boots for them. I remember Mrs Page and her four children coming back looking like death last Christmas time. Page had been out looking for work, but he never went further than the King of Bohemia to find it. And all day, while he was drinking, they had been shivering out in the rain. In the old days, there was a shelter of the bar, but now there ain't that any longer. Only Harry kept dry, him being over 14. Mrs Page told, told me a gentleman stood her half a quarter and gin, but the children had nothing all day, and they was half dead with cold and hunger. Massacring of the innocents, I call it. For all the children set dairy, they was laid up in the infirmary next day. The baby died the next week of bronchitis, and Mrs Page, she took a heavy cold on her chest. Now she's coughing her poor heart out in the Tysis ward, with the wall taken out on one side and the winds and the fog coming in shameful. It is the truth, for I used to scrub in the Tysis ward. Mrs. Kemp had an all weekly over that. Kemp wanted a day off to look for work. Though being a cripple, he ain't got no chance. And when he took his discharge, Master told her she and the children had got to go too. She says that she wasn't going to go um, and wander the streets with no clothes and no home. Then the Master tells her, as she got to go for to is um, uh, she had got to go being that them two are one and it's the one and if she wouldn't go quiet she'd be put out by force then mrs kemp went off in one of her tantrums flying out in most fearful well then you shall have the truth she says which i've been keeping quiet for shame I ain't married to Kemp, never have been. My first husband deserting me and going off with another woman, leaving me starving at one and 20 with two children and another coming. Kemp offered me a home and then he's been a sight better to me than Johnson, who went to church and swore to be faithful, but couldn't manage to keep his oath, not even for three years. We'd never have been in here if the motor car hadn't run over, Kemp crippling him for life. But I shan't take my children out to die of cold, not for him, nor no man. And now you know I'm a bad woman, perhaps I may be left in peace. And she was. That's just what I was telling you. The law is all on the side of us bad uns. I'm going back tomorrow to my neat little home with my lady help is minding for me, to my dear children and my regular income. And I can't say as I envies you married ladies with either your rings or your slavery. But don't the neighbours find out, Pennyloaf? No, not they. They don't know as I'm a bad woman. I generally moves afore a confinement and I as a husband on the ICs. Besides that, I has a good connection cooking dinner parties in the West End. If your cooking's good, I find there's no nasty questions about your morals. I think we won't get married, my pet. Better keep single, I say, after what I've heard here tonight. Well, what I've heard here tonight is a lesson to me. I'll not get married, not I. Just look at Mrs Cleaver, an honest married woman. All her husband has done for her is to bring her and the kids to the house and now they say she can't even go out and earn a living. Then look at Penny Loaf, rich, free and prosperous, and the kids her own. The bad uns wins my pet, vice triumphant, I says. Oh, I do love my baby.
Her Inside oh. received a small grant from the DCMS, Local Community Connections Fund, to share the work more widely and run some writing workshops. We're now going to perform a group piece that came out of that workshop, looking back on the past year. Each member of the group wrote brief sentences in response to the question, how shall we mark our losses? How shall we mark our losses? I will walk defiantly through the park at dusk with my daughter. I will light candles whose soft flames comfort my blazing heart. I shall remember these days and refuse the old normal. I will tell everybody that I love them. I will join my sisters in mourning and silence. I will stand on my threshold and shout to the sky. I will plant seeds. I will make bread. I will seek out silence. I will gather phrases. I will write down voices. I will write about her. I will write to her. I will be part of the next movement for women and make sure the next fights are for something more rather than the same necessities. I shall mark my losses with vague imaginings of hopes fulfilled and enterprises endeavoured. I will climb inside the cracks of a fractured landscape and breathe new life through the power of sisterhood. We shall embrace each other hard and fast and often. I shall tow the memory of my friend as I swim deep through water. I will smile for her every day. I will smell her scent every day. I will pick flowers for her every day. I will, re I will remember her smile every day. I will remember her softness every day. I will remember her every day. And now, a few words from Dr. Susan Croft, Unfinished Histories Director and the producer of this evening's event. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope you enjoyed tonight's readings and performances. Now, at this point, if you'd like to um, turn on your mics and your cameras or both, um, then you can join in applauding the, the actors either in the traditional manner or with Zoom hands as you wish. And then um, after that, we'll have a short break before we go to the Q&A if you want to stay for that. So thank you very much. You can also post feedback in the chat. Bravo. Fantastic. Bravo. Well done, everyone. Bye. Our video is stable, <laughs> but our, our... Uh, we, Where's the video? <laughs> Sorry, I guess we could probably have to bring you on slowly. <laughs> yeah, we can't, we can't, the video doesn't work for us. Some of the host has, vid has silenced so. video. I think, thought we could, uh, I'm here. The, uh, the Zoom learning <laughs> curve, as we should refer, <laughs> bring anybody, uh, people on. We could do it all in one and it's not working this time, but thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all very much. That was Great, very moving. Yeah, yes. very moving. Excellent. Yeah. Well done. Thank <laughs> you. Fantastic. Thank you. So we'll now have a five minute pause and then if you want to come back for the Q&A, you're very welcome. Thank you. And as I say, messages in the chat are very welcome also. If you have a question or a comment that you want to make and you'd rather not make it aloud, you can also um, post that in the chat and we'll you can put it to whoever you want to give your question or comment to. Thanks. Okay, so welcome back. Um, so we're now in the Q&A and you can either post questions in the chat or put up your hand to speak or use the technical hand and we will call on you. 
But before then, I'm going to start with a few questions to Susan and then open it out for the people to ask questions of Susan or members of the cast and crew. Before, um, before I, um, you ask me the questions, Judy, can I just thank the cast who've been brilliant and also uh, if they can appear from the darkness, Domi Dominica and Lucy, who've been our Zoom technicians tonight and have just done an amazing job. I mean, Zoom's such a learning curve. I think everyone's finding what you can do with it, but also what's hard to do with it. And um, every experience I've had on it is you've kind of gone another little step further, but it's, it's quite hard. There's a lot to still to discover. Can, I see, can we see Lucy and, uh, I don't know, and Dominica? Oh, there they are. Where's Lucy? Oh, we can't see them. Spotlight, <laughs> Spotlight Lucy. Uh, Lucy and has the patience entry. of a saint. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, at this point, it's probably best to go to gallery view, and then anybody who wants to appear can appear. Or if you there they are. Yeah. There they are. I see them. Lucy and Dominica. I yeah. see. Yeah. <laughs> Brave, brave ragazze. <laughs> Thank you. Miss Snow. Right, I'm up in the top corner on mine anyway. So. <laughs> and mine. <laughs> wow. Right. So, Judy. Okay. Judy so. okay. so, Susan, Dr. Susan, how did, her in <laughs> how did her inside Women in the Lockdown blog come about? Okay, well, I think, I mean, it came out of the play reading group, which is... Um, part of whom were uh, you saw tonight, in that um, we were doing a number of play readings. I was uh, on Zoom, which were based on the work that I'd done either on New Women, um, which is sort of suffrage era um, plays, or alternative theatre plays from the Unfinished Histories project I run. And particularly the New Women plays, as we were reading them, we kept finding there were all these resonances with the lockdown that we were going through. Lots of plays about women's lives where they're trying to kind of break from confinement, either that's been imposed on them because they've been educated in a way is to have low self-esteem, low social expectations. They're trying to break out from that. Um, or because of unjust laws like the women in the workhouse. And um, it was sort of starting to think really that um, in a sense, while we were all struggling with lockdown, in a sense, women had previous in that area, women had a history of confinement and struggling against confinement and enduring confinement and finding strategies to kind of come, get out of that um, and make it more endurable and, and, and refusing it. And, you know, the domestic violence issue, which was obviously people became aware of fairly early on that, that, that also had a history where there was acknowledgement and struggle and that was there in the place. So I wanted to bring together a space, create a space where both that historical material and new responses to lockdown could all be shared in the same space. So that's how it came about. Yeah, well, it works, doesn't it? So then this event, so tonight's event, technically very complex. How did it come about? Okay, well, um, at a certain point, um, I was thinking we, we, we're having these, these um, events and sometimes we'd have people come along to the play readings and they wanted to just watch um, rather than read. And some of them we had just such positive responses to. And some of this was to the play readings generally, not just the stuff that was on Her Inside, that we did do a sort of group reading of some of the Her Inside material last year. And it just became sort of gradually an idea, well, that maybe we could share this with a wider audience and at the same time, um, make the blog more accessible to a wider group of uh, contributors and readers. Um, and then there was a, a roundabout, it, was, it all quite happened quite quickly, sort of late January, um, the Local Connections Fund um, advertised that there were small grants that could be applied for and so I applied for a grant and we managed to get a grant which would enable us to do the work meet workshops. So Sarah and I have embarked on that. We've done one workshop. We've got another one next week. And the group poem came out of the first one. 
Um, but also and there's been a number of new contributors who've been emailing and saying they'd like to send something into the blog. So it's kind of growing from that. And also, you know, just want there was so much really great work coming out of the play readings that I wanted to to throw the performers in the deep end and and uh, <laughs> <laughs> see what happened. Well, I think I I was naively thought it was going to be less uh, difficult, I guess, <laughs> when we started. But as I say, you kind of learned with Zoom. It, theoretically, it all works fine. It's just yeah. You know, there are lots of last minute headaches that then occur and you sort of uh, have to find your way around them. So both Lucy and Dominique have just done an amazing job in kind of <laughs> keeping people generally fairly calm and kind of getting us through all of that. <laughs> so, uh, well, well, I think uh, from, from, from inside, not her inside, me inside, I think it worked really well, remarkably well. And I've seen quite a few plays on Zoom and I've never seen one with as many actors. And I think it's fantastic. Um, so, so now you've got some new people here, I guess, who've never heard of you or what you do before. How can uh, new people contribute to the blog? So, well, I mean, the the um, you should have the link if you book by Eventbrite from the information there to the her inside stories wordpress um, I don't know if if, if Izzy is there at all somewhere in the. In the darkness but Izzy who's done an amazing job as our web designer um Izzy Shaw she's um sort of helped develop it um and, and set up all the different pages there is a contact page we're hoping to get the contributors information up on on the blog itself but if not just email and I can, I can send you out some information about how to contribute your material and it's you know we've already had about four or five new offers of contributions even this week so it's growing and it's great the more it's a conversation a dialogue between women from all sorts of backgrounds and experiences then you know the better or anyone who identifies as female you know it's it's a space where we can share our experiences and I think at the beginning we probably all sort of thought oh it wasn't going to be that long you know mm. was thinking oh this is going to be you know outdated by June <laughs> Hello, <laughs> laughter. so um <laughs> So I've got one more question before we turn to the audience. Um, so if people want to join your play reading group, may they do this? Uh, I know you have to live in London to do that, don't Oh, do you? No, you don't, because of course it's on Zoom, so you can join from wherever you like. We've had people from Mexico and Canada have joined and America. So um, wow. if you're interested in coming along, then... Uh, generally happens on Thursday evenings at 7.30 GMT. And, uh, you know, please email and I'll put you on the list to send the script out. OK, so um, shall we see if anyone in the audience wants to ask a question? Oh, here we go. I'm so like someone's speaking. Maybe just speak if you've got a question. Make sure you're not on mute. As an audience member, I have a question for Fiona, Fiona Graham. Is Fiona still here with us? I'm not sure who she is actually. Ah. She wrote she wrote um she wrote one of the pieces. Yeah, um, it was the, her use of um, Utori. Yes, that was it. Yeah, yeah and uh, I recently found that as a, a Japanese um, explanation for what I would call spaciousness. I was going to ask her whether she'd come across Shisa, Shisa Kanko, which is a, another, another term about... Um, it's, a, it's used on trains in, in Japan, where you, um, you slow yourself down by pointing out your actions, like I'm going to the, to the bridge to pick up the milk. And apparently that stopped a lot of traffic accidents on the, on the trains. I was, I was going, that was my question for Fiona, but maybe I've saved her from that <laughs> anyway. But uh, it's been such a varied and beautiful evening. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, I wondered what, um, just a question to the readers of the group poem. Um, it came out of a, a, an, on the back of another poem um, a kind of list poem and I wondered how did it feel um, 
having that one line to to really put all your power and energy into the one line that you had and I wondered what, what any reflections on the group poem as the group facilitator I wondered um, what you what you felt and thought about that well the lines themselves were quite powerful and, and in fact they resonate well one what people said and the ones that I said they they all resonate don't they because we're all in it together so that each line felt personal it felt like the lines we were assigned made it your own um, you know you thought about what you you know the person you're the person who's saying that and if it was about someone else then you thought about someone else it might be about yeah so it was quite powerful actually Is the order of that of that poem it was the order that people put put their responses in the chat, um, and it was just after me repeating that prompt over and over again. How do we how do we mark our losses? How do we mm. that kind of thing over and over again? And then people just sort of responded it. So it was very much a column response in terms of the making of that piece. That's good. Yeah, um, and it, I really felt that you did it a great honour. And I felt really privileged on behalf of, of the group. And I managed to do a quite quick recording of it. So I'm hoping to share that. And I'm hoping that they'll see um, your, your wonderful performances, which were so individual and so, I mean, I could see it in your eyes, little stories going on. And it was such a pleasure to watch. Thank you so much. Okay, um, question from Nora. Yeah. Uh, is oh, right, there we go. Is this uh, project um, given uh, a record and account from alternative his, alternative women's history project in the east end of London? So, is it uh, recorded for it, Nora? I'm not oh, sure. I, I, I'm not. Oh, there I am. I, there I am. Hello. I'm not saying recorded, but given a, a, an account, uh, a contribution, uh, a record. I mean, I'm not sure quite what records they keep of the projects as part of Women's History Month, but we are part of the Women's History Month Festival. And, you know, that again was another reason why um, the project kind of came together, because it's about history and it's about now and the two things interweaving. Um, so it made every sense to sort of put it forward as a a project within that festival um, and I'm very happy to them, for them to have you know copies of the script and any other information from uh, you know, what happened. Um, there's a question in the chat saying is the group poem available to read mm -hmm. and all the other pieces we've put up links to and I'm hoping the group poem will go onto the, um, onto the blog but at the moment we have we've got the next meeting of the um, workshop group next Tuesday and I have kind of have to get formal agreement from them that it can be put on, on, on into a public context. They were happy that it be performed, but you know, we just need to double check that before it goes up, but it should be there available before long and maybe more pieces that come out of the workshop. I'm hoping so anyway. Okay, yeah, end of, yeah. Um, yeah, someone's just put up, it would be helpful if it could reach a wider audience. Yeah, what the, the that poem or the project as a whole? I don't know, Sarah Boyd. Okay, find it. Lucy's just put it up in the chat, so there's the uh, so it's there. It, um, at least oh, the whole pro she just said the whole project, yeah, the whole project, yeah. I mean, I'd love to for it, for it to reach a wider audience. We've got this question really of finding funding to, to enable it because at the moment, um. I imagine there probably are mechanisms to generate some funding for a blog, but um, I, I'm not sure quite how it works. And uh, obviously performances as well. We've managed to pay a token amount to people this time from this bit of funding from the Local Connections Fund, for which I'm very grateful, very grateful. But yeah, longer term, it's sort of, you know, quite a, quite a, a demand. I think the performers found that this week. And I think possibly, you know, we, we might have been a bit, a bit ambitious, but I'm glad we were as well. So, you know. Uh, can I ask a question, Susan? So yeah. it, we've, you've recorded this tonight? 
So is it possible that people who couldn't get to see it um, could see it later? I hope so. Uh, we've got to sort of probably trim it a bit because I think I recorded all the, the last minute tech at the beginning as well because I'd put it on yeah. to record. Yeah, so we don't want to, that. To, uh, <laughs> and the panic and the, the point where yeah, someone... That's quite human though. I loved, I loved being part of that, witnessing everybody that and having a good old chat with Judy just to just bond, <laughs> do some bonding just before... <laughs> You know. I, I think and I'd when, like a record of that uh, that, that tech uh, tech. Yeah, <laughs> when Rita's Wi-Fi went down, it got a little bit <laughs> um, anxiety provoking, shall we say? But yes, there is a record of it, so I'm sure we'll find a way to put at least part of it or most of it up there. Yeah, we, we could have a bloopers yeah. section on the on the on the website. Oh, that's good. Yeah, no <laughs> everyone was very, very, very respectful and polite to each other. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'd just like to say, Sarada, I loved your poem. It's really, yeah, I loved it. I can't see who's speaking. It's Jo, Joanna. Hi, Joanna. Hi, jo. Yeah, yeah, I loved your poem. Thank and, you. And I thought you, you said it beautifully. And uh, it's great. And Nora as well. It's great to have people reading the stuff they have written themselves. Mm. You know, that's, yeah. that's so nice to hear. Um, and uh, yeah, I just... It's been a great privilege. I'm quite a new member of the group and it's been a privilege to do this. It's, it's been a lot of fun and really, uh, and such a variety of pieces of work. And, you know, uh, the April de Angelis was written in 86, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, just think, well, I didn't, know, I didn't know about this play. And it's, I, I think that's extraordinary, Breathless. And, yeah. um, and, and, and the idea that a play can be really short you know, like behind doors is very, it's actually very, you know, very neat. Um, but it says what it says, you know, it does, it, 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 make, it makes such a strong point somehow. Can I ask a question of the audience? Because, um, um, you know, because there were a few times in, I think probably earlier in the rehearsal period, that where I thought, oh, this is a bit too dark. And uh, that, you know, probably it would be too heavy to did anybody find that or you know you could feel free to sort of say you know you'd rather have some humor in lockdown it was interesting at the beginning of lockdown when I mean, there were loads of memes going around mm. and there were, you know lots of, of jokes and I think that's tended to stop we've run out of jokes a bit <laughs> not laughing anymore yes. uh, Nora says here we go Nora says it was very dark. A lot of the material was very dark. Can you hear me? Yeah. They say uh, on radio stations. Um, the material was very dark, very complex, very uh, lengthy, and therefore um, quite difficult to digest. Uh, but I managed it. Uh, <laughs> extraordinarily and Ridiculously, obviously, my small piece for today, I apologise, which was about potatoes, was one of the shortest pieces in the repertoire. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, in due course, and uh, I, I really worked hard at listening to the play's uh, material tonight, but I did find it very... Um, um, uh, it's it's very intellectually um, uh, difficult. So respect to all of the people who wrote it, all of the people mm. who performed it, and all the people who listened to it tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Liz in the, in the chat is saying not too dark or heavy and nice to have something to think about. So that's good. And somebody else said that it was a good alternative to the BBC and Netflix. So that's nice to hear as well. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, someone's asking how long did all these take um, about the process? Or the process to, to, um, to put together the blog or to put together the piece, I wonder. Um, the, in terms of the, the um, actual performance tonight, I think it was only, what, the 18th? I threw the performers in the deep end with a text which um, they've you know, hadn't at that point read before. Um, and they've done an amazing job. I mean, so that was only last week. And then we had, we've had rehearsals. I felt we've had some separate rehearsals. I had a separate rehearsal with 
um, Catherine and Bridge on, on Breathless. And, um, but otherwise we rehearsed on Monday evening, Tuesday evening, and then we had a tech tonight before we did it after the read through last week. And it changed quite a bit in the process. Only realized it was even more material and it was too much. So um, mm -hmm. if you thought it was too long, then you're lucky that we did cut it, but um, yeah. I mean, I thought it was a very strong beginning and I, I wonder in hindsight, if I had known the context and the, con and the actual context of the pieces and, and if I had a vulnerable group or a group that I would have to signpost um, some, of the, some of the themes uh, ahead of time for people to know that these pieces may contain things. Um, I mean, it was great that we had the link to um, Domestic Violence Helpline as well, but I think it's also, it's good to do that in advance for, for some groups and that's some audience good. members. That's a good point for yeah. future. I think that's true, but when you think of what's on television at the moment in terms of, mm -hmm. I mean, nothing about the pandemic except, you know, in, in oh. the street, they're wearing masks. Do you know, but I mean, nothing d dealing so directly with it. Um, I, th I think it's, I think it's all right. I mean, I, I can see your point, you know, we did deal with domestic violence and things, but no more than, no more than mainstream television at the moment. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I completely yeah. agree with that last point. But I think also there's a, something about the immediacy of having a Zoom link yes, into your home. They're sort of in the room with you, aren't they? Yeah, and just yeah. that it is a kind of, and we're all kind of in our own spaces and I can see p people's pictures. And so there's a kind of familiarity there and yet we don't know what anyone's going to say. Um, yeah, so yeah, but I take your point, um, yeah. Um, I, I think with the television now, um, yeah, most of the things are repeats. So of course, um, lockdown isn't mentioned or the virus, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't, because filming new things is difficult because of the situation of social distancing and wearing masks and, and there are a few projects happening now but they have to be very careful with social distancing and and how, uh, whether they've been uh, had the vaccination and all that so i wouldn't knock television too much because i think they've just had to repeat everything <laughs> they were made, you know. i was say, what i was saying is that i don't think i think television can be just as upsetting you know in the subjects they deal with I mean, I wasn't saying, obviously, they can't deal, they can't deal really directly with lockdown. I think that's what's been interesting about doing this is that we're all, you know, we've had all these rehearsals, but we've never actually, I mean, one or two people I know from before, but most of us have actually never met in a room together, which I think is rather extraordinary. Yes. And yet, extraordinary. I feel very connected to everyone. And I think it's been a, 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 a really wonderful experience, actually. I mean, despite all the, you know, the pressure and the things that went wrong and didn't, you know, it's, it was everybody in the end stepped up and, and that was fantastic. That was lovely to be part of that because it's what we've all missed in lockdown mm -hmm. is any sense of belonging to a group, especially, especially for, for, for actors. It's like, you know, the thing that you value most is like connections with other people, your creative process. And, and it's been a gift. Uh, and I, that's what we have to thank Susan for, I think. She's, she's given us something. Thank you. I very agree. Much. I mean, I, I think that's obviously one of the hardest things as people involved in the theatre that we've just, you know, again, this, there's been this sense that, you know, things were going to get better. Maybe they could start doing socially distanced performances. And some people did at the end of last year and then, all of that closed down again and now they're talking about june and july but we know the, go the globe is opening on the 12th of april i think they said with their yeah. distance performances and distant audiences i mean I'm, i find just it's amazing how creative people have managed to be finding ways of delivering performances um you know showing things they've recorded beforehand or whatever or finding new approaches new to do socially distanced performance or to do performance on zoom so um i was glad to sort of try and jump into that and do you know set something up and see how it went so i'm really glad that it's worked for people ali you had some a question i think yeah i was just going to say that 
it just felt like it was real lived experiences that the the piece sort of conveyed and it, it was done with such warmth and strength and I felt that there was like a real understanding of the subject matter so I didn't find it sort of boring or turgid or depressing or it just felt quite real and I felt quite privileged to have discovered it on Eventbrite this morning and then landed up <laughs> here so thank you yeah that's great <laughs> thank you yeah. thank you Ali that's a lovely comment yeah thank you I I wanted to say something about the re Oh, who's, who's hello? A breach, yeah. I wanted to say something about the um, the actual the play readings that we do, because the thing is that there are some members of the um, of the readers in the in the readers who are who are these amazing actresses who have been around since alternative theatre days. You know the the proper alternative, and so now and again we get some stories, which is just absolutely fantastic as an adjunct to, to reading those plays. It's just amazing. Then the, the, the other stories that come up, and I think, oh gosh, I'm you know it'd be nice to sort of have this recorded. I know that to have it recorded, then you have to have someone transcribing. <coughs> oh, volunteers are welcome, aren't they? Saying <laughs> <laughs> is some very very old actors. The We're group. the old bats that are still here. <laughs> well, you're in the first way. Thank you. Friends. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, seriously, the, the, the simple act of reading plays, you know, weekly or fortnightly over the last year has been a great gift, really. Um, it just to, you know, when you can't work and when you are used to doing work and you know the, just the opportunity to read plays so regularly and read new new things that you don't know and and just meet online but still meet with each other so regularly and and just explore something new each week has been great and it is really important and i think that's mm. a great a great tribute, actually, to Susan. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah. Very much. I agree, absolutely. Uh, and I think it, it's great fun uh, reading. Uh, some people hate it, but reading a play that you actually haven't read before, and it's, you really have to jump in and just take take a risk, you know. Uh, um, I, and I've, I think it's great doing that. I'd just like to say that... Um, everybody i thought everybody was brilliant uh and uh, i had a lot i i have a lot of difficulty i've not done a play re reading on zoom before and i i find it very difficult give me the person to person uh, world i much prefer uh cause, because it's very difficult to uh, it's the thing of looking in in the direction of the camera so you're not looking at the person who's talking to you. So you're supposed to react and, uh, oh, it's, and, and, and then you're reading it as well. Um, I just don't know how actors do it, really. But um, I, think, I suppose it's easier if you're not reading, you're, you've learnt your lines, you know. Um, but everybody, everybody else was so great, so perfect. <laughs> Me, I'm going, I don't know where I'm looking. <laughs> You, know. you were fabulous. Yeah, okay. fabulous. <laughs> I really enjoyed your performance, Mary, and especially um, it was the first performance, wasn't it? Um, of the behind closed doors, and I was I wanted mm -hmm. to ask um, the performers Ashwa and is it Joe um, and Mary about because it looked like you could see each other the way you were like you, where your eyes were looking as well as how you were delivering. I was wondering how could you say something about your rehearsal um, techniques? And how did you Managed to do that. Well, I don't. I don't think well, I wasn't looking at anybody except um, trying to uh, trying to uh, uh, you know uh, be somewhere where the camera would see me, so that I wouldn't be looking away or like that. Um, and I actually did have the reading script in front of the squares, so I actually couldn't see. The people I was talking to, but I knew, I could hear them, so I knew. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
you got I, well of course in radio you do see the person but um it, 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 i think it was very much voices that piece so in a way it was easier that you didn't have to see the person because it, they were just voices coming in it reminded um, me of Sylvia plus three women the way that the voices were. would come in and out i don't know if anybody knows that yeah. play. Yeah. Mm. Uh, i'd like to read it uh, also we um um N nicola uh Veronovska, is that her name she mm -hmm. she i mean we were looking at the camera as much as we could sarada <laughs> but as well as trying to read the script but um and i think if you look into the camera there is this feeling of we're connecting with each other but also the playwright had despite the fact we're each in our own bubble as it were in our own stream of consciousness our own reality um, the playwright had put certain linking passages. So, so Mary, uh, Mary's character Kasha would say, "I don't want to die," um, but actually, that really made me tear up the way you said that, mm. Mary. Mm. I don't want to die alone. And then you'd have me going, "It's not going to kill her," you know. So you'd you'd have these uh, <laughs> um, similar themes coming out at the same time. So, you know, the three of us would come out with a, "I'm tired," but it would come each from each person from a different place. And that was very interesting. Yes, very interesting. What about you, Ethel? Um, yeah, so I found, um, because I was in Vicky's world, because um, we were all next to each other on the Zoom, but you were just in a complete separate headspace. So I was just trying to be in Vicky's whole, whole world and, um, it did feel like we were connecting, actually. Yeah, like what Joanna said. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's got there's quite a lot of challenges with doing a play reading on Zoom because I mean, if I look at look here, I'm actually looking at the camera. But if otherwise, if I'm looking at the gallery view, then I come across and I'm I'm looking somewhat below the camera. And that if, mm -hmm. even if you put the script on screen, then you're looking at the screen, not quite at the camera. So you can sort of see why they have people with cue cards standing right next to the camera when they're doing television, because yeah, you've got to sort of cheat the eye line. Otherwise you are sort of looking somewhere slightly, just slightly off yeah. and trying to make all of that work together. Can I, can I say that uh, in that one, Joanna, when you were looking up, looking obviously upstairs to your daughter, but on my screen, you were looking up at Efwa. <laughs> oh. And, it, it reminded, and I, I soon realised, of course, I thought, what, is she looking at her? No, she lives next door. And then, of course, I realised you were talking to Melody. But it reminded me of that um, spoof university challenge yeah. when they're all sitting on top of each other. But, of course, in real life, they are not sitting on top of each other. They're each side of the questioner. But they all started to throw things down on each other. I'm afraid that came into my mind. <laughs> that was so, the young ones. The young ones. The young ones, yes, the young ones. Yeah. Well, I guess we are all sitting on top of each other in our kind of often in our little yeah. flats, but, you know, yeah. kind of all going through our different struggles. I mean, I kind of, um, as someone who's lived in it, living in a flat with, with well, for most of lockdown with, with three other people, one of whom has just gone back to university. You know, I've been very aware then talking, meeting people on Zoom sessions and on play readings, some of whom are kind of living in, in small flats on their own. And so they're kind of struggling with that. And I'm sort of struggling with a need to try and find a bit of space sometimes. So, you know, <laughs> yes. all these different versions yeah. of lockdown um, yes. you know, need for some headspace to... Susan, can I just can I just say your uh, Zoom background looks like a Victorian derogatory, <laughs> or like right. Lewis Carroll, or possibly a tenual drawing of Alice through the Looking Glass. Oh, Great, <laughs> and it's in sepia for some reason. I don't know why. Oh, right. Okay. Everybody, I love. I enjoyed all the performances and everything, and I like all your backgrounds, but I do like your derogatory one. Thank well, I can have you. to go there sometimes <laughs> and inhabit that space. So I like that space. Yeah, yeah. I like that space. Better than the BBC. It's a Zoom space, isn't it? It's kind of slightly yeah. different space than, from reality. But, uh, yeah, no. 
Anyway, we're coming up to 10. Has anybody got any more questions or comments or um, because that would seem to be a good sort of point. Sue, are you? Put, you've got... I'd just like to say I'm really sorry. I missed loads of it. I was at something else till eight o'clock and then I had a wine box collapse all over my kitchen and I've spent all my time looking like I'm wiping up blood. But I was listening to it. I thought you all did a fantastic job. I'm now quite drunk because I'm trying to drink what's left. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to say a really big thank you, Susan. I'm hoping that, you know, when you come back after Easter or whenever that I can rejoin because I've found a lot of exciting plays doing this and I've had a lot of fun and I've met some great, great women. And um, yes, fabulous to see you. And well done, Judy, my twin. For being the host you were amazing that's a jolly good job for you you're obviously really good as a compare because you have to think about what you're saying which is really good Excellent. well that's the best excuse for drinking i've heard yet and uh, so yeah i should also say and dominica did you want to say something no i just wanted to say thank you for letting me be part of this it was so enjoyable i i enjoyed every performance uh, great evening really thank I, you. I admire you and congratulate you and thank you for such a great evening dominica got sort of thro really thrown in the deep end and kind of roped in <laughs> to help i think was it sunday <laughs> possibly monday <laughs> monday tuesday you know, she's not had a lot of time to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm really glad I'm, I'm part of this. Thank you so much, Susan. Well, thank really. you. Thank everyone who came along. And, uh, and the uh, play reading group is open to as well, uh, I should yeah. say. Uh, thank you, Dominica, for speaking and showing, uh, telling everybody what a proper Polish accent is like. <laughs> <laughs> That's really embarrassed me now. <laughs> <laughs> No, your okay. Mateusz was perfect. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I know you. Babcia as well. <laughs> okay, well, and can I thank all of my performers and Zoom crew again? And uh, can we all thank them also? The, yeah. all the and thank you as an audience. Bravo. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, I will might send you an, a, a questionnaire and invitations to future events if we're when we've recovered from this one enough to start thinking about that. So, thank you and good night. I'm leave now. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, you can go and have a much needed <laughs> drink you. in the bar. Right. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Right. Thanks, Susan. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you, everyone. And, See uh, everybody uh, again. Yes. Yes. Lucy, when I've recovered for the next play, thank you. Yes. Okie dokie. Thanks, Susan. All the best. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa, Hi. for coming. Uh, and Sarah, thank you for coming. Uh, well, in the illusion. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cheers, my dears. Thanks, Mina. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Speak soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Sarah, thank, thank, you. Sarah and thank you for coming. And yeah, I'm just going to save the chat. Susan, I, you deserve a glass of wine. I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> get one well later. done. <laughs> you too. Well done. Bye. <laughs> Good night. Screaming Sorry, and great. crying. I was really impressed with that. Wow. You really. <laughs> all the, what? Yeah, all the, the baby, the, the crying and the children, the sound effects is amazing. <laughs> 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 yeah, we've. Uh, Alan, in your inner child. No, that's the cat. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Good night. Okay. Good night, everyone. Cheers, Angela. Thank, I'm not yeah. sure who you are, but thank you in the dark. And Lisa, see you soon, I hope. Yeah. Okay. Bye, all. <laughs>